Thank you so much, Shay. That was so beautiful. Thank you so much. I hope you're feeling energized and centered and ready to go because we're going to get into some really deep conversation. We're going to be talking about Black community and opera, and that is a hot topic right now. And um, I just want to have a chance to talk with some people who I respect now, whose opinions um, I respect. So let's get started um, with that section. Good. So good. <laughs> Thank y'all so much for being here. Thank you for joining us today. This is going to be a great conversation. Just to start off, I'm going to introduce our panelists and in the digital booklet, which is online at blackwomeninopera.com. You can go right there. It's the first thing you see on the website. You can click the links to click the name of the participants and they will show you their website, the bios and things like that. And you can follow them on Instagram and all that jazz. So thank you so much for being here today. So we're going to start off with Chantel Brazil, who is a soprano. And she has a recital this evening. Hi, everybody. Good so seeing your beautiful faces. Thank you. <laughs> for her this evening. Next, we're going to introduce Victoria Davis, um, who is also a soprano, a very singing soprano. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Next, we have Patrick Daly, who is a, a countertenor and the founding director of Big Blue Water Initiative. And then we have Candace Burgess, who is the founder of I2C and also, I imagine, a soprano. It's always a good guess. <laughs> You really can never go wrong. <laughs> so I want to start off by talking about a little bit about how you discovered opera, how you discovered Black opera history. Um, so I'm going to start by saying, did you grow up with a strong sense of Black opera history, or how did you fall in love with opera? So we start off. I can start. So. I did not know anything about opera until I went off to college and it was my former voice teacher to, who introduced me to such singers such as the great Leontine Tice, the very first opera singer that I have heard. I didn't think about opera before then. I didn't even think that I was capable enough to sing it until I heard the majesty and the beauty of her voice. And since then, I began to have an entire respect for those, for opera, it's particularly Black opera singers. So I began to look more into opera and singers such as Martina Arroyo, Marian Anderson. I knew she was a singer, but I didn't know she was classically trained. Jesse Norman, everybody we know and love today. And I looked up and researched every classical composer at that. And since then, I grew to have such a great respect for them, particularly because they are African American and they pave the way for, to, to open doors like you and I. And they made me believe that if they did it, if Leontine Price did it, and Marian Anderson did it, then I can do it too. And I am entirely thank thankful. So that's how I was introduced. Well, I'll go ahead and go. I'm trying to, you know, let the, you know, I'm all about amplifying the voices of Black women. So I was like, I mean, I really won't try to go, but I'm going to go ahead and like cut on in here. Hi. Um, so, you know, I think for many, for many of us, for many Black singers, you know, of course, our frame of reference for many, not all, but for many would be, you know, coming into Black church. Um, so that is a frame of reference for singing initially, right? Um, I also will say for me, another reference that I, I was aware of early on was in like through PBS. Um, I think PBS is very key, like public, <laughs> like has been very key in sort of guiding things. Um, and then just coming up in a household where my parents, well, my mother particularly rather, uh, is an educator. So knowing the power of the arts you know, being exposed to different things in the arts in the city of Nashville, where I'm from, was, was key as well. 
the other thing that's very key, and it's not necessarily, and again, this isn't opera specific, um, but it leads us down that path. I'm also very much, you know, geared and reared within a very strong HBCU community here in Nashville. My parents went to Tennessee A and I. She well started out A and I did in Tennessee State. Um, my home church is in front of the school. I'm still a member, still serving there. Fisk is down the street. Meharry American Baptist College on the other side. So there's a lot of that around. And my impetus to even study voice was because I wanted to be a jubilee singer. That was the that was the whole point. It was like I'm going to Fisk and being a jubilee singer. Now anything else came like <laughs> it became a different animal after a while, right? But you know, so like the idea of opera specifically was not, was, was, was sort it was just, like I said, it was like an idea. It was like, it was just kind of abstract. Um, we hear names. So I knew who Denise Graves was. I knew who Leontine Price was. I knew who Mary Anderson was. I knew who Paul Robeson was. I knew their names. I didn't necessarily know their full importance and their full impact. Um, and so that comes and I, again, this is for me, it's very much reared through HBCUs, but also Black community, because then I did the NAACP AXO, and I was in the Greater Rear Prize for Taking Music through Negro Spiritual Scholarship Foundation and some other things that was like, oh, you didn't know about all of these people, or you didn't know what, and, and I, what singing is, what Black opera singing is, what the, the relationship to um, Black singers, HBCUs and the Negro spirituals is, let me show you. And like having all these people being able to tie that in. So it comes, you know, with little seeds, like uh, Karen Hunter on her show, the Karen Hunter show always talks about breadcrumbs. And it was these breadcrumbs that were essentially established that dotted along the way that I picked up and picked up and led to something else. Um, so that's where it is rooted for me. If you don't mind, I just want to pick up after you, Patrick. Um, I was introduced to opera in a, like, in a similar way. Um, I grew up going to, um, going to different classical shows. My mom would take me to ballet, she'd take me to the symphony, she would take me things like that. But I never went to the opera. Um, and I think in part because she wasn't really exposed to opera as a child. So my exposure for opera was in school. So I would see different videos my teacher would put on of people singing opera, um, see it on TV, hear it on the radio. And I never really thought that I would be, that was a possibility for me. I thought, you know, I just want to sing pop. I just want to sing gospel. And funny enough, in my church, there were some like classical singers. So I kind of heard the song, but not quite all the way. Um, it became a real thing to me probably in sixth grade. Um, in sixth grade, I decided I was tired with the voice lessons I was having um, and I wanted to learn how to sing opera. So I started out with art songs. I continued with art songs um, through going into high school. And along the way, I had a teacher who um, was interested in Black composers. So she introduced me to Margaret Bonds and um, Leontine Price and all those great, great, great singers. Um, but I wasn't really serious about it until I went to college. So I went to college, started studying opera, um, probably June, not junior year, sophomore year. I was tired. I was super burnt out, super tired of opera. And I decided on a whim, hey, let me go look up Black composers because why not? And I know that Black composers exist. So started doing that research and realized there are a lot more Black composers than I thought. And they were composing longer than I thought. So I got into that tradition and started I Two Sing. Well, I guess it's my turn. <laughs> um, Interestingly enough, classical music has always been in my life in some shape, form, or fashion. It's kind of a compilation of everyone's journey. I grew up with it in my house. My mother loved Beethoven's piano sonatas. Um, it was the only thing I could fall asleep to as a baby. 
I personally started my journey um, with music in the Baptist Church in DC. Uh, and interestingly enough, Patrick, when you were talking and uh, Candace, when you were speaking, it kind of took me back to when I was younger and I would hear the old woman with the woo, but you didn't know what that was, right? So it was like, oh, I, I kind of already know what this operatic sound is, but I didn't recognize it as what it was because I just thought it was, everybody knows that's kind of like a power move with black women in the church when you could do that. There's always that one who comes in, holds the note, okay? Um, so I always grew up with it. My first introduction to a sort of classical sound was through the sound of music, um, which was one of my all time faves, it still is. The music is fabulous. The golden era of Broadway and musicals. Um, and uh, seeing Leontine Price's uh, commercial for I think the Negro College Fund. And I didn't, I mean, I knew the sound was pretty. I, it was something I'd heard my grandmother kind of sounded like her. She was a very high soprano, um, very short high soprano, kind of makes sense. But, um, so I, I grew up with it in my ear, but I was just like, okay, sis, whatever. Um, and it wasn't until I got to high school, I went to a performing arts high school in DC um, and he made me sing Caro Mio Ben. And he told me my teacher, his name was Edward Jackson, God rest his soul. He uh, one day put me aside and he was like, you know, you can do this. And I was like, yeah, I want to, but I, I mean, I'm not doing this. Like, I don't know anyone who really looks like me. Leontine is kind of the goat, Madam Price. So it was kind of like, she's over there, but I'm all the way over there. So there was no, you know, correlation. Um, and he charged me with an assignment. I'll never forget it. He told me, I want you to go home and I want you to research. He had all of these black famous opera singers, but of course the Jesse Normans, the Kathleen's, the, um, the Riri Gris, uh, Paul Roberson, all of the like the people who we look at and like, I just want to kiss you and behold you. Um, and he charged me, he said, I want you to go home, because this is when internet was out, and say, uh, type in black opera singers and just listen to their sounds. And there was one video in particular that I came across and it was Jesse Norman at Carnegie Hall in this fabulous purple dress with this gorgeous big natural hair singing Dish Tora Hala. And she was thick and tall. And I watched this woman command, I think it was like 120 people in an orchestra. And I watched her bunny hop. I watched her slow walk and like float on air. I watched all of it and I was like, oh my gosh, this black woman who's thick like me, who's dark skin like me, who has this sound where uh, in choir, I will be told to shut up because I'm too loud, like me, okay, period, um, was commanding, I think, what, 2,000 people in the audience, over 2,000 people in the audience, and an orchestra behind her, and one of the greatest conductors at the time to conduct and was unapologetic about it. And so I kind of came back like the next day with my, my tail between my legs and I was like, okay, I guess I'll kind of, I'll try. We'll see how this goes. And he walked me through it all the way to uh, college when I got to Overland, um, built my community there. Interesting community. It looked very different from what I was used to um, but it was a community nonetheless, even though it was different from what I was used to. Um, and now I've graduated from Oberlin, I graduated from Manus, and now I'm here. And I guess that's my started from the bottom, now we hear story. All right. Yes, I love all this, these stories about just showing how much representation matters and showing how much it's community matters, like black community um, and opera really matters. For me, the same story, church, black community, high school teacher, learn this music, go, go to school and now I'm singing opera. So it's like those seeds are planted, like Patrick was saying. So 
just I think that as we, as opera singers, we should definitely remember that we have an impact on the people that are around us. They, you might be the only black opera singer they know, but just plant that little seed and you just never know what could happen. So I love all this conversation. So as we're talking about how representation matters so much, how do we hold these opera companies accountable for what they say they're going to do? Because things are coming back. Um, people are doing programs, operas are coming back, the companies are reestablishing themselves, and some things look different. Some things look the same. <laughs> so how do we as artists hold these industries um, and uh, executives and companies accountable for their stance on Black Lives Matter or diversity? Well, I know a lot of you are part of the organization or have heard of the organization BOA, Black Opera Alliance, and I admire them so much because they are a great organiza organization that I know personally that took a stand when all of this happened, the pandemic, Black Lives Matter, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, they took a stand. When the opera company shut down, that is when particularly Black opera singers really opened up their voices in which they couldn't speak before. So they took a stand. They wrote down a very nice professional letter to the opera companies saying, demanding a change. So if we can do that in the pandemic, when everything prayerfully opens up, don't let it go away. We don't want to let it go away. We still want our voices to be known. I personally want every mine and everybody's voices to be heard, but we have to keep it going. Don't let opera companies be ignorant of it. Even after this pandemic, keep it going. Because if I have heard so many times, if you want things to change, I have to be the change. Just like uh, Michael Jackson's song, I'm looking in the man in the mirror. We have to change. We have to open up our voices. And I believe if we continue that, just like the BOA Alliance, this organization, everything will change. We will have our voices heard, but we just have to be persistent about it, even after everything has opened up. So I believe it will, but just keep going. I concur. Um, I work with BOA as well. I'm part a member. Um, just a little plug, sign the petition. Um, if you feel led, donate. Um, follow us. We have some stuff coming up and we're trying to continue pushing. And we also have some good big news coming up. So stay tuned for that. Um, in addition to BOA, I think um, making sure in your own work that you reach back and help other singers and help younger singers so that they can see that, oh, there's somebody that looks like me that's doing this, that cares about me, that wants me to do well, that wants our people to do well. Um, I'm also a member of BOA, shout out, because they are really doing the work and putting the foot to the pavement and getting it done. Um, I think the first thing that we need to address is the fact that this is a sort of re-energized movement that has forever been in place, um, but at some point in time lost momentum. But with that being said, um, we have to continue to regenerate ideas in the 21st century in 2020 with HD broadcast, with how we can correlate, how we used to hold those recitals in church um, when we were raising money for people like Lanty Price to get to Juilliard or whatever, um, and how that looks now because it looks totally different, pandemic aside. Um, what I really love and appreciate about what BOA is doing is they're going for the heads. Um, they went straight for the top. They addressed the administration because the administration, they're the only ones who can change this. And it's not without them uh, recognizing it because they recognized it for a long time, but there was no real push uh, behind it. 
but with that being said, I also want to say that um, I'm actually really proud of what these opera companies are starting to do. Now, it can be because they have no choice. We all say, okay, let's, let's, let's be honest. Like, we're not going to play fake punk, okay? But even with that being said, for them to actually listen to people who usually in this field have no voices, young people, like we're young people, we, we're not on boards, we're not, we don't have shmoney to throw at them, like it's none of that. So I appreciate the fact that they are looking to the younger generation for assistance and reaching back in that respect. So I think it has to be a sort of changing of the guard with respect to um, how one generation can relate to another with, a, with an art form that's 600 or so years old it has to do with how we relegate um, what community actually means now, because a lot of people haven't stumbled upon that truth quite yet, because they think we can still, you know, do what we've been doing before. Um, it has to do with momentum and keeping that up. Um, and I think now more than ever, with the pandemic, people are realizing, hmm, I love opera but I don't have to sing opera to love it, but I know what I can do to help those who really are su supposed to be singing it or should sing it or whatever, however you choose to sing it, to, to help build this path to keep it going. Um, so I think it has to do with all of those things in one. I don't think it's gonna happen overnight by any means. Um, I think we were all kind of shocked, but kind of unshocked when the Met was like, yeah, we're, we're pausing. But I also think it was really beautiful because in that pause, I could tell that they took the time to really think about it and premiering, shut up in my bones, fire shut up in my bones, as opening the season instead of Porgy, which I love Porgy. I love Porgy. It's a beautiful piece. But that's saying something about them changing something within their own system. Um, because the Met is, is more traditional in the way that they view opera, and there's nothing wrong with that. But Shut Up In My Bones is a, is a total, total opposite. It's a, it's a 180. Um, and as the leading opera company in America, for the most part, to do that, I think that's, that's some, there's something to be said about the direction that we're going in and uh, the promise for tomorrow and how they will look at young artists and people of color. That's it. Um, th I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed what everyone has said. I definitely agree. Um, I want to expand it some because I'm also a part of BOA, right? Been in those initial meetings, been in those things. We see the posts, really excited. Um, glad to be doing the work. I think that we are a people who can do multiple things at once. Um, and it's also evident by even whom we have here, how this is even going on, right? Um, and we can also have multiple goals. We are not, mono, we are not monolithic. Um, I have come to a place personally that white spaces are not my primary goal. They're not my primary pinnacle of success. They do not affirm me. They are not, my, like they can, they can, it's like, it's nice if there are white spaces that do, but I do not make that my be all end all. We have had, we have had as a, as a people within our communities, we talked about what happened in church. We talk about these things, right? And all, you know, that's beautiful because I'm grateful for it. I am the great grandson of, I, I always like to say this, I'm the great grandson of Western Chief Sharecroppers, Mar Pearl and Daddy Fred Slocum. Mar Pearl lived to be 102. And my grandmother, who's 92, it was the high note soprano. I came to, had a church that was, you know, the first lady was a whole soprano. My high school voice teacher was a protege of, uh, of, of William Warfield. Like, I come from that stock. I get it. Right. But one of the things that Mr. Krim, so if you ever see me on Instagram, you see me talk about the W. Krim singers, a.k.a. Wakanda Corral. We're named for Mr. Krim. Mr. Krim is my is my teacher and he's still living. He still teaches at Tennessee State. 
And the thing is, the man with the Eastman, he went to all these places, but what he has done is has come to Nashville from living in St. Louis and all over and come, been in Nashville for these years and has served this community. And the thing is, I have so much things to say. The thing about it is like, what he did with us was he trained us to do multiple things. So we very much are in the bel canto, but we can literally do anything we want, right? And not, and was always about giving us all of the tools to do all of the many things, not just as singers, but also as leaders, as conductors, as administrators. We, had a, we did have a village around us, like all the way around. So the thing is, the thing about it, every, like, I love what many of us are asking. We are definitely, we want to hold these companies accountable. Well, I'm going to talk to that and then I'm going to talk to another thing. Holding them accountable, it, it, it's only going to work if that is their real intention, because a lot of this is about looking good. A lot of this is about being able to say you're not this and we want to make it and uh, again i'm not and i'm not i'm not I, we got to sometimes look at some tangibles you know what are you doing you know what because a lot of it again is about getting the people i've and i and i'm saying this this is the thing i'm on a couple of boards i know victoria said you know we don't have some money i don't have some money either trust me i don't but i'm in nashville i'm one of the few black people in nashville that actually do this part of the reason why in and i'm just i'm gonna be real i don't care they know because I've said it to them already. Um, I said it to all these organizations. I have been in, I have been in conversation uh, on HBCU issues with Opera America for, for a couple of years now, at least for a year or two, however long. So listen, this has already been a thing and I've already said it to them. So they already know. I said it to Nashville Opera. I've said it to Nashville Symphony. I'm on the board of uh, what I'm on the board of Nashville Opera. No, I'm not on the board of Nashville Opera. They, uh, I'm on the um, I'm running a program for Nashville Opera right now. That's in partnership with Tennessee State. I have said it to the Symphony. I'm on the Arts, Nashville Symphony's Artistic Planning Committee. I'm on the board of Alias Chamber Ensemble. I'm on the board of a couple of other organizations, of course, the founding director of the Big Blue Opera Initiatives at Tennessee State University. And I have told them very specifically, the goal for this is not to, uh, I've said this to many, to, I said this consistently, this is not to build your workforce. I'm not looking to build your workforce. What I am looking to do is ensure that we have, we, we are, we're getting the equitable information that when our students and our communities say that we want to have something, we can have it that is either inclusive of you, that works with you, that even goes into you, or that is purely our own. The thing is, and what is so funny, and I love being a singer, I love this art form, I, I'm a counter tenor, I sing a lot of early music, I sing a lot of these things, I'm in convers there's a lot of stuff happening. And I've been, and I'm with, like white companies who have been very good to me. So I'm not, again, this is not a, this is, I'm, I'm just thinking at the, whole, at the whole spectrum and how we can really unpack some stuff, right? We have had a history. There was the Negro National, there was the National Negro Opera Company. There were all of these spaces. There were, our HBCUs were full schools of music. They, had, they were doing full scale productions, full orchestra, every, like th th they did it all. We've done this, we've been this. And some things happened along the way that when things opened up, oftentimes as a community, we said, well, well that, cl that closes. But the thing is that for what we wanna see in terms of our uh, uh, being the representation and the brilliance that is on the stage, there are models for it. Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, Dance Theater of Harlem, Philodenko, Dallas Black, Atlanta Dance Connection, Urban Souls, That's in Dance, Talk Theater, all these Black opera theater companies, Black theater, uh, um, sorry, theater companies, uh, oh, I've just thought, left out another, Collage Dance Collective in Memphis. Um, shout out to them, no, like all these people. You got theater, black theater companies all over the country. And 
black singers and black opera and, and black folks within opera are consistently sort of saying as a as a whole, hey, let us in big companies. And it's like, if we're not doing if someone and the thing is, and I had a and this is a, a colleague of mine said this, and I'm gonna tie it like this. A colleague of mine said this, um, who's not black. I was singing with, uh, well, I'll say the company. I was singing with Opera Louisiane in Baton Rouge. Wonderful company. They've been so good to me. Shout out to them. I wore this shirt when I did a panel with them. Um, and the thing I like about, and it's also about the smaller, but what I love too about some of the smaller companies, they're very interested in doing and pushing the envelope. Even the production that we did, even at, um, at New uh, Opera Louisiana, even at Shreveport and some other places, they've been interested in like doing some different things. And even, even in the rehearsal space, I felt affirmed. I was appreciative of that. I didn't necessarily expect it, but I was appreciative of that. But I had a colleague say, you know, you have to define your own definition. You have to have your own definition of success. Is, your own, if, is success singing in the big houses? It's, or is success also singing what you like, when you like, how you like? And I was like, you know what, ma'am? Thank you. That changed my perspective. So now I'm like, whether or not I sing in the big houses, I'm, if I'm singing at this church, if I'm singing and, and consistently at this church, on this session, on this record, and you can see, actually, that has been my career. If I'm being around some of these luminaries, right, there is success. So it doesn't have to look like one thing. We also have models within the opera community. Shout out to Harlem Opera Theater. Harlem Opera Theater, Gregory Hopkins, Professor Gregory Hopkins put me on. How I got to sing and fill, fill in for Victor Trick Cook was because of Gregory Hawkins at Harlem Opera Theater and then George Faison, we did a show with his theater, Opera Creole, yes. We did a show with uh, George Faison's theater and George pulled me in and then Victor and, and, and Rod and Thomas saw me and was like, oh, come on. It's been black folks who put you on. We're gonna put ourselves on first. And the thing is, there have been, there are spaces that we can do. So we have to also invest in those spaces, not don't, but see, this is the thing. We don't invest in those spaces to show them that we, like, we don't invest in those spaces for them. We don't invest in those spaces to, 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 so that they know that we have resources. When they come to us, and this is what I have consistently done whenever I work with any of these organizations, well, what you gonna bring? Can we partner with you all? We really wanna like do some outreach. Cool, so how much you put in towards this? Yeah, you're gonna foot the bill. No, you're gonna, and you're gonna put the bill and then you're gonna bring it over here. You bring it into the hood. Yeah, and, you, and the thing is, you may not get to have, you may not, because agency is key. You, we gonna lead this. Do you really wanna do this? I walk into a boardroom, the first board meeting, I'm wearing like a, a button up and everything. I'm looking very nice. Next thing, I'm wearing these Adidas joggers, like a t-shirt fitted, what's good? And it come, I come in late on purpose. Now, I'm from the suburbs. I'm from, you know, I have degrees from Morgan and Boston University, but I'm coming in like, yo, what's good? Because if you can't deal with me, then you really ain't trying to do this. If the hood ain't coming, then what we doing? The hood got to show up. Respectability out the game. Again, we can do multiple things. I love singing in the nice houses. I also love working for the hood. We gotta, we gotta work them all. It's a heavy lift for the entire collective. And even redefining what that lift looks like. Okay, I'm done. I just wanna like build on what you just said before we move on. Um, I'm from Pittsburgh. Chantel's from Pittsburgh too. Um, and there's no reason why, especially in school, we never learned about the National Negro Opera Company. Literally, the, the house where it was housed is six blocks from that house, something like that. I grew up at a church that was even closer. Church was right in like, um, the, the place where it's called is homeless, now like currently a hood. But there, there's no reason 
why I should have learned about that. Um, and to that point, I think that there's an accessibility problem to a certain extent with our stuff, like with black led opera company stuff. We don't know about it, especially the younger people don't know about it. They don't, I think we need to do better with outreach and um, our branding and our messaging so that we can recruit people and so people can see us because we're out here, we're out here in numbers, but we just, I, I don't know. Like, I think we just need to do, be better at outreach, be better at figuring out our messaging and branding, especially, so we can get out there to those people and bring them into our communities. I absolutely agree with what Candace has said. She and I are, are both from Pittsburgh, and I can tell you how many Black young opera singers are here in this city and they are not heard they are not either heard they don't people don't know about them they're not given a chance and there are so many of us not just here in Pittsburgh but just around your local city someone once told me two people a couple of people actually told me bloom where you're planted grow where you're planted but how can I grow if I'm not heard if many people who look like me are not heard so like Candace said, we have to find these singers and give them the opportunity to be heard, have outreach. Can I just, I know, listen, Renee, we know how I am when it comes to speaking, so I'm a behave. Um, first of all, Patrick, child, you preaching. You done did a whole sermon. You wrote a whole new theology. I'm, listen. I'm here for all of it, all of it. But uh, are we allowed to raise questions? I know we're supposed to be on time, but you know, we. I'm trying, I'm really, because there's a fire shut up in my bones, like Jeremiah, all right? Shut up. Um, I really want to go back to what Patrick said, because I thought it was, it was really important. Um, about how actually all of what everyone has addressed but in their own way but specifically patrick because when you think about it i don't think the issue or the root of the issue is community per se because it's there i mean i'm i live in brooklyn i live in i live in new york i like to call it the underground opera community um it is freaking massive there are more people specifically black people who sing opera in the new york city area than you would i mean we know that new york is a hub but you would be surprised at how many people when you look at them on the outside or whatever they're like yeah you know i work in corporate america but 7 p.m. and after they're like, yeah, I'm singing Donna Anna, Don Giovanni with like Heartbeat Opera. I'm with Bronx Opera. I'm with Opera on Tap. I'm doing X, Y, and Z. Um, so my question really is not necessarily how we can provide outreach because these companies are there. There are a lot of, of, of smaller companies who are really doing the work. But my question is more so with, with us, how do we how do we balance how do we how do we balance this career how do we how do we address the fact that there are people i mean not everybody's going to be a leontine or a shirley or a kathleen but with these communities that are already in place how do we really acknowledge them how do we how do we keep them coming back to the, the smaller companies? Because believe it or not, a lot of these big companies are looking at the smaller companies and like, how in the world are you maintaining and not going in the red and living your best life and having full orchestras and going and having innovative sets or having these composers come in and commission works for you or having Sister, Sister Fanny May come from the church around the corner when I've been asking for 20 years to become a subscriber and she gladly gives her money. Like, how do we, how do we how do we work that because it's not for lack of talent we know that people black people come out for black people hell excuse me i'm sorry heck porgy showed 
all of its behind last season, every night, every night. Okay, first lady and bishops coming out in their Sunday's best, okay, with the fur, not the faux fur, the fur, okay. So how do we, how do we, I don't want to use the word harp, but how do we harp on that, on those movements better? Because it's not, I think that's the frustrating part, it's not for a lack of community. It's opera is not going anywhere, it ain't dying, it's I'm so sick of these people saying it's dying. I mean, opera has been dying for like 300 years. Like, chill, bro. Stop. Like, it's not. It's not going anywhere. How do we? How do we address that? And I love outreach. I love doing that stuff. I'm involved with Opera on Tap. I'm currently working with uh, Opera Ebony right now, and a, a few other companies where that's a. Those are huge components and huge pieces. And these kids are all the way into. You would be so. Surprise. Little Jimmy could tell you more about opera than probably Susan, okay? Because it, it's, it really is in them. They know it either from a Reese Cup commercial, they know it because they got the opportunities to go to see a production and it was like, wow, this is mind blowing. Why are you, how are you making that sound? What is this? Like, I don't understand. But like, how do, how do we address that? Because like you said, I mean, the, the I'm sorry, uh, forgive me if I butcher the name. What is it, National Negro Opera Company in Pittsburgh? I just read about this the other day. There's a whole house that's still standing there that needs to be like a, a, a freaking monument of sorts because it, it's the oldest opera company in the world for Black people. But it kind of just, it's it's so removed. It's... It's so removed, it's in the cut. I think the building is past repair at this point. It's barely, it's holding on to God's unchanging hand. But like, how do we, how do we address that? And I'm tired of the word of mouth thing too, when it comes to us learning about our history, that gets annoying as well. So how do we further even address that? And I'm gonna be quiet now. I think the disconnect in our histories is a very intentional tactic of white supremacy. You have to know that. And, and when we know that, then we have to address the problem because there are certain things that are innate to our African bodies that we remember culturally that are ways that we connect with each other that are not um, conducive to like the traditional trajectory of connection. So the traditional trajectory is a marketing strategy that is um, helpful to people who created it and those people are not like us. So I think that we have to reach back into our bag and remember culturally what things are important to us, like community, building community in the church or building community in the neighborhood, um, having meaningful relationships with people, continuing to do the work that you're already doing, putting on programs and recitals, or you can build in relationships with schools, build in relationships with, I don't know, Girl Scout troops or whatever, whatever you can do as a person, like just like remembering those cultural connections, like that are important to our African bodies, our black bodies, because that is what's really going to bring that, that connection back. Cause that disconnect is so intentional. Can I add to that? Um, I'm glad we're bringing up, the ancestor organization of National Negro Opera Company. Um, also, shout out to Ho Opera Ebony Wayne. Got my heart. Um, you know, there's these are so important. I think so. Candace has just wrote in here. So one of the things that one of the ways to kind of start this, and I think okay, there are a couple of things to do. We kind of work a whole lot of things. Okay. Um, so, see, I get excited. So representation and symbolism are one thing, but representation means nothing without accountability and, you know, intention. So I do, so I, I, it's a, what's the saying? Uh, a. Scott Bolden says it a lot on um, Roland Barton's show. Um, you know, during the Obama administration, you know, black, he's, uh, he often says black folks never left the inauguration, right? So everybody got excited. Like, oh my God, black president, woo! And it was like, okay, so where's the work? So even with our folks who are in position, you know, hey, push us too, push them too. Say, you know, 
let's do that. And also not only, so again, looking at the whole infrastructure, looking at the whole equity. So one of the things that I just wrote down in my notes, we got to, as a collective, and we work this out, this could be a BOA thing, this could be all the black opera companies, this could be HBCUs, what have you. Let's talk about it, let's put it in the, in the universe, into the atmosphere, and let the ancestors and God work it out. A national Negro opera company his heritage historic site, that has to be key. It has, like, th that house needs to be redone, re renovated, rebuilt, however you got to do it. Get it with UNESCO, get with, um, uh, um, you know, the, the, uh, whatever those, those, those governing bodies, um, get with the government cause they owe us get with all of these folks. And then all of us put our money into it too, because part of it is also saying that we're investing in our own. I don't care what you give. And I'm gonna say this because when we started the big blue Opera initiatives, we had no money. When I started the Burley festival, I had no money whatsoever. Okay. It was just me and my mama and a few people. And all I did was just ask some people to give. I looked up a couple of years later and I found out how much we actually had in that Burley Festival account and that big BBOI account. And I said, oh, this is after folks are giving mostly 20, 50, 40, 80, 100, a few, maybe a few give a thousand. But little makes much. It all adds up. So that's one thing that can be a tangible piece of what we want to see not at not only for a business perspective, but also as a point of remembrance to remember and to also help lead us forward. Because it's also that's all that's a part of Sankofa as well. You know, looking back to see what we have done to move forward. The other side is when we are collaborating with these folks. Again, I think a lot of it is going to be it, going back. Somebody had put it in the chat. That money piece is going to be key. Um, some of these things, when we are giving when we're working with different companies or we're working with these folks and they're getting, and they're getting, uh, they will actually be the ones that apply for the, um, for the grants, right? So it's not necessarily, so it's not necessarily, so this is not a shade to anything, but I'm just, you know, let me not say that. They're, they'll be the ones to apply for the grants. <laughs> let me be, I gotta be careful. Uh, they'll be the ones to apply for the grants. They get the grants and they disseminate, right? And so we're looking at, and a part of what my big conversation has been to these organizations is going to be about, and has been about, okay, we should be eligible for those same grants. When we apply for them, we don't get either, we don't get them, we don't get the same amount of money. And the thing is, we, I remember, and I've done, when I was in high school and we did those plays and things at Fisk University, and Fisk is this big, and we did shows in the theater. I mean, sorry, we did, the, the theater is, this big barely the chapel is this big and the gym is this big so it's only but so big and we had to build sets and all these kind of things having nothing having little you know an old hbcu adage is i'll find a way or make one we have we have consistently especially as black americans who've been here for a long time like who've been as, as and, and and within these experiences we have a consistent, and, and even across the diaspora, we have consistently like been working and just surviving and making much out of little. And so we have to work on getting as a community to a place of thriving. So this outreach and this getting folks in is going to also be about, again, asking, well, what are you going to bring to the table? Not just, oh, that was representation. That, not just, oh, that inspired some young children to do this. Thank you. It's also going to be about where, because I tell my students when I teach music appreciation, you know how they always say, um, uh, uh, what do they say? You know, biz, uh, uh, business deals are made on the golf course. I said business deals are also made in the concert hall. When I go to the symphonies, when you see whose names are on these different things and who's, oh no, that's all business too. That's all, that's all don't, okay. So what I'm also trying to do when I teach these, and what we got to do is look at our whole collective, not just the singers, not just the musicians, not just the people in. Your homeboy that got a good old chicken restaurant can be a sponsor. Your homegirl that is a, uh, is a licensed practitioner of whatever is a sponsor is a you, your, your realtor friend is a sponsor your you know your 
you know, these other folks are sponsors. We got to get our folks to also get into it. And I think too, when we can hold ourselves accountable, when we can, again, have the money or even, and even have the money to be able to dictate how we want it to look, that's going to answer the questions that Victoria has. Because now when she says, I see this, all she got to be able to do is go to that church, that mosque, that, that community, that organization, that friend, because we got folks who got money. We got to get them also engaged, but not getting them engaged for them, though. That's the thing. I'm not trying to get them engaged for these big companies who, who, who have old time, often slave money. I'm not. I'm looking to more so get them engaged, get our folks engaged to be donors for us first, and then whatever else you do is cool. My mama gives to all these folks. My mama gives it to the HBCU, and we listen. I I give to Morgan, Tennessee State, Fisk, um, Oakwood. I give it to a lot of schools. And guess who else gets my money every now and again? Vanderbilt, BU, where I did my master's. Yeah, they get my money too, but my money is primarily going to us. It's making that dollar circulate. So then that way we can dictate what really happens in our communities. There we can really shift the equity lens as a whole. And that's going to answer those questions, I believe. Awesome. So uh, in the last couple of minutes, I just want to talk about a little bit about just the fullness of Black identities. I think that when we're talking about Black community and opera, we have to remember that there is there are intersections in those identities as it relates to race, gender, sexuality, um, size. All those those types of uh, identities are essential to understanding Black community. So I would love to talk about how we can address the fullness of Black community in opera with respect to those intersections, and also just some uh, words about your hopes for the future? I would say to answer about my hopes for the future, my hopes for the opera, just like Patrick Bailey said, we it takes a village. And my hope and prayer is that every Black opera individual, every Black classical artist given, is given a chance that there will be more doors open, that we will create our own, that we will have more Black opera communities, Black conductors, Black administrators, and we can all strive for excellence. And for those who study and sing opera, I want, for me personally, I want to have the opportunity to sing whatever I want without limiting me. It's like Leontine Price said, accomplishments have no color. And I believe that as long as I am prepared, as long as I know my stuff, I strive to be the best that I can be, I believe that I will. But I also hope that they don't limit me or any of you guys because of the color of my skin. Now, granted, Singing and Porgy and Best at the Met has helped me grow as a person tremendously. And I'm so thankful that I had the opportunity to sing in Porgy and Best because I have been around so many talented people, cast and ensemble alike, who has, and their rich voices, Every the first time we open our mouths to sing, it's like the voices of heaven came up on that stage. And I believe we were a sign of hope. However, I don't just want to be limited in Porgy and Bess or Aida as much as I love them. I don't want to be the the only opera that I sing. I want to be um, one someday sing Mimi or Liu or Countessa, anything that I want because I'm Chantel. I am my voice. People can hear me, listen to me, not seeing the color of my skin. But granted, I am proud to be African American. I have so much love, I have so much support, not only support from my family, but I'm also, Candace and I are also in this group called Opera Diva Slaver, Slayers. And we support, uplift, encourage each other. Our mentor is Dr. Ch Tiffany Jackson, and each Friday night she invites such mentors 
and such opera singers, such as George Shirley and Morris Robinson that spoke to us to guide us. I want that to keep going. So that way we can, there can be doors open for us. But that is my hope. And I believe if we push to that, if I can be the best that I can be, then it will happen. So. Um, I think some of this work in addressing the intersectionality is going to be, it's going to have, ugh, good God, help us, help us, Lord, because it's going to be about also decolonizing and our, um, many aspects of our own, um, beliefs, um, you know, recognizing where things come from recognizing the, the, the nasty roots of where they come from, not the, not the source. And, you know, especially myself being a Christian and having my own beliefs, I think a lot of it, and you also have to remember history. So much of how music is developed is developed through the lens of state or church. And music was being developed through church systems. And these church systems were perverted to undercut anything that was other and anything that was an affront to a system that only allowed all, certain people to be at the top, right? And so nothing's wrong with the, some of these bodies uh, like in their truest form, but how they, how they manipulate, how they dictate, how they move is the issue. So then, you know, when the kings and the queens who are also going to this Anglican church who are also going and following the this da 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 this is what really shoots, moves how even we as Black people throughout the diaspora, that colonization has impacted us. So it's going to be impact, it's going to be moving some of those things. And I bring up a couple of books and a couple of sources. Um, there's a great book that freed me also as a Black shamed and loving man who was good and saved. The, a book that flee, freed me was is called Boy Wives and Female Husbands, a study in African sexual, Boy Wives and Female Husbands, uh, a study in African sexuality. And talking about how, you know, how, and especially in this, one of the things that, uh, that happens when you see it in, 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 in many indigenous cultures, Native American and others, there's always a respect and a reverence for what is called well, like the Uman or the third gender. Right. So culturally, we respect it. And it's also really funny. My, one of my best friends, he lives in the he lives in the hood. He lives in the projects. And he says, there's a trans woman that I was I was I came to pick him up one time. He was like, he's like, oh, yeah, that's uh, I think her name is Peaches. He's like, yeah, that's Peaches. Yeah. And I'm going to use the language that he said. Pardon me. He said, yeah, she run this hoe. So this is a, in the in the projects. This trans woman, nothing happens unless she says it can happen, right? So we have it. We may not use the same language because he used some language that was not the, the current terms, but she runs it. So we also have to understand culturally things and like kind of decolonize all of those things so all of our people are whole. Um, so that boy, wife, be my husband's freed me. Another book is right here, Flaming the Peculiar Theory of Politics of Black Milk Gospel Performance. Um, by Dr. Alicia Lola Jones, musicologist, ethnomusicologist, who is also an Oberlin alum, a, D, a Duke Ellington alum. Um, check out chapter two, I'm in it. But I'm bringing up her, her up because she's doing work around, again, this is around Black men, primarily, who are in these different spaces and how we comport within our own spaces, right? The book is about how we comport in our own spaces not just there. So when we fix us, when we deal with us, then we can move out. And I also want to shout out the, um, the Black Opera Research Network. That's a, new, a, a fairly new organization as well. Um, so yeah, this is all of this stuff out here. We got to really decolonize some things for ourselves. Some of this is going to be some internal and communal work as we also push these other people to say, see us, represent, see us, but also can we see ourselves? Let's break some things down. And so that's going to be some deep meditation. That's, I'm glad we did that. That's going to be some deep decolonizing work. That's going to be some deep staying on your face and being mad at this and being mad at that. It's going to take a lot of work. But, 
you know, and I think that those things, as I close to go towards the future, and I'm not going to say nothing else, hopefully, those things will help lead us to that bright future that gives us the equity and the, because us about the, uh, the, the agency, agency to be able to move how we want. We want to be able to just, I want to go over here and not feel a problem. I want to go over here and not feel a problem. It sounds utopian. Why can't we reimagine it as utopian? Who can say I'm a dreamer? Maybe I am, but we can do this. That's why we're on this ball of, on this, on this ball called earth to keep figuring these things out. All right, I try to keep it brief. Um, ask the question again, Renee, because I swear he'd be preaching y'all and I'm all the way here for it. So the two questions were about inter intersectionalities in Black community, and how we can address the fullness of Black community, and also just your hopes for the future of Black okay. community. All right, I'll start with the latter and then go back to the former. Um, my hope for the future. <sighs> Inclusiveness is such a sticky word to me because it implies that sometimes it's forced. Um, and I don't like that. If you, If I have to force myself into your space, then I don't need to be there because there's going to be uncomfortability regardless. So that's not my hope for the future. My hope for the future is for people to, uh, I guess the word for me would be progression. Constant progression. A lot of introspection has happened during the course of this pandemic that people would not otherwise have if they continue with their daily lives because unfortunately we live in a capitalist society where we are constantly pushed to work. Like even the way that we think our existence, unless you work really, really hard and you're really introspective, is surrounded by what you do, what you own, what you have in your account, if you're married or not, if you have kids or not. I don't, I don't think if this pandemic, that's why I always say that it was a God thing. And pardon me if that offends anybody, if you identify with that as universe or spirit. Um, for me, I identify as Christian, so I call him God. For me, I think this pandemic was a God thing because it made every person on the rock we call earth sit their behinds down and think and process. And it has been hard and it has been difficult it has made people antsy. So my hope for the future is progression, but progression for me means introspectiveness. Um, and through introspection, I think we can all push forward in a really positive and a unique way that has never happened before. Um, out of the Spanish flu, we went into the 1920s where some of the greatest works in American history were created, whether it was the Harlem Renaissance, whether it was just modernism and art, and whether it was just uh, novelty with books and how people thought and the pers perspection and the way that you dressed and the way that you felt. Um, that's our grandparents' generation. That was my grandmother's generation. So the way that she grew up was formed from pandemics and things of that sort. Even something as simple as um, she, used to keep <laughs> she used to keep butter wrappers in her freezer because she always wanted to be prepared for when the next thing happened, but it helped her to have an understanding of what life was and what that meant for her journey. Um, <sighs> intersectionality, it goes back to what Patrick said, a lot of in in introspection. Um, we have been so colonized to the point to where people have beliefs about things and the one question that they don't ask themselves is why that one word can provide so, i mean literally um so i have a therapist not a not not a, a shame to say it i'm all for therapy everybody needs it this pandemic has been hell on earth but in a beautiful and crazy way um and one of the, the questions that my therapist always asks, and it gets on my nerves, I can't stand. Sometimes I'm like, I'm hanging up the phone. But 
she always asked, she said, well, why do you feel this way? Well, why this or why that? And it really kind of knocked me off my feet because there were a couple of times where I could not sit down and I couldn't ask or answer myself when she would say, well, why? So I think with intersectionality, when you have a, a bias and bias, bias behavior is human. There's not anything particularly wrong with it, but when you compare or biasness is, is conducive to hate or overly prejudiced behavior, or when you comment on something that you don't understand because you don't understand it and you do so in a negative way, ask yourself why. We can't get anywhere unless people are introspective about that. Why do you hate the LGBT community? Has somebody ever done anything to you? Have they, have they hurt you physically or mentally or spiritually? Have they um, done something that maybe doesn't necessarily agree with your moral belief? And if that's okay, I mean, if that's the, if that's the case, that's okay. Agree to respectfully disagree because the, the Bible that I read, I don't think Christ ever condemned people to the point of making them hate or making them feel this this negative and go in this negative space he made people think and become introspective but i can't think of one moment in my bible personally where when he was talking about stuff that he made them feel some type of way in a negative way um so i think a lot of it starts with the question of why and people are going to struggle with that it's going to be the hardest thing that some people have ever done or experienced um, because sometimes why doesn't have a, a, a black and white answer. Sometimes it's taupe, sometimes it's Heather Gray, um, um, but you have to sit with yourself and really figure that out. And until we do as a community, as a people, as artists, and artists are some of the most intelligent and creative people that I know, but artists are also some of the people who have the most hangups because there's so much creativity, there's so much going on in your mind. The way we process is completely different. Um, but until we ask those questions of ourselves, because you can't, you can't affirm in a community um, when you haven't sat with yourself and understood yourself as now. Like 27 year old Victoria, I have to learn to understand because she's different from 26 year old Victoria. 26 year old Victoria in the way that 27 year old Victoria will see things in life is gonna be different because of experience and growth. Um, so I think with internet um, sectionality, I think we need to really evaluate that um, and perspective. Another huge part of it is just perspective. The way that you grew up, the way that someone else grew up, they're totally different, but it doesn't make it any less valid or any less important or um, any less right or wrong. So I think once we do that, it's going to take a lot of, a lot of mental work. And maybe a lot of physical work too, who knows? But uh, it's gonna start with the mental um, for me. So I think that's how we would address it. And I'm gonna shut up. No problem, thank you so much. So we have a, a, a quite a few questions, but we don't have a lot of time. So I'm gonna ask this one, how do you recommend fighting for your, your blackness in uh, academic setting, specifically as it relates to a person who is the only black singer in their school? And, or in their university. How do you do that when you don't have much support from your peers or faculty? And how do you do that without being tokenized? I, I can answer that. So what I did when the whole Black Lives Matter and the George Floyd thing was my school really opened up with about that. And I personally wrote a statement about how I feel that although I absolutely love my school, I would love to see more qualified black voice students, black voice instructors to come into the room and teach us, teach, um, do black 
opera seminars talk about the history of past, present, and even future black opera singers for the matter. But of course, they need to be qualified and capable of doing the work, which I know that they can. But these are more just my ideas because I remember when I first started graduate school, I looked up and researched more of these classical singers that I didn't know about. And I shared them on social media and I even shared them to my school so that way people are aware of it. So I feel like if I take that first step, people need, um, people will possibly consider that. And also, I am one thing that if I don't even get the support, I will still be the best that I can be anyway. I can still do the work. I can still be my authentic, proud self and not even know it focus on what focus on the craft focus on what i love to do and if it's meant to be which i know it will be the rest will flow but that's what i highly recommend reach out to your local schools reach out to your local communities if you are in school then i recommend writing a statement or talking to somebody you trust and who would know who you would know would listen to have these teachers have these black qualified voice instructors to teach about the history and rep that we can sing alike spirituals arias art songs and um talk about singers who have done that so hope it helps also i have some really quick to cut in i think reaching out to the um different organizations too they could be very helpful in that work and a lot of times that um they're more than willing to help you, help advocate for you. Um, some groups that I've found helpful in my journey, African American Arts Song Alliance, I found a lot of community and started building my network through them. Um, Kappa, see, they have given a lot of young singers opportunities. I haven't personally been able to partake, but um, I've seen their work and they're doing, the, they really are doing the work. Um, Facebook group, classical singers of color and support group. That's been very helpful. Um, it takes you through the steps of applying and picking your rep, you know, building um, even your seven areas that you can shop around. Um, so, yeah. Okay, I really have to speak on this because as somebody who went to one of the top conservatories in the country and was the only black person in her class. I understand a lot about tokenism and I understand a lot about how you need to operate in these spaces or what it takes to operate in these types of spaces. Do not let them try to turn you into a carbon copy of who you want to be as an individual they will try and it doesn't mean that they're going to try because they're trying to manipulate you but they have an idea of what blackness is in this field and they will try to press that onto you do everything in your power to stay authentic to you because the community and the people who supported you from jump loved you regardless if you got into juilliard or regardless if you go in the pg community college do not let them change you into who they think you should be you research you you figure it out within yourself again it takes a lot of introspection uh and and, and thought you have to really think about that don't let them um i remember for my senior recital they tried to make me sing only spirituals because that's what black singers did that's what my voice teacher said my black my white jewish voice teacher said black people at this school you always do a spiritual set I said, not I said the cat, the devil is a liar. We know way too many composers out here. I mean, Nathaniel Dett graduated from Oberlin. Moses Hogan graduated from Oberlin. You're not gonna sit here and tell me that I can only do Hall Johnson or Harry T. Burley. Research these black pieces because what I found when I researched them, when I looked into them, and these are not pieces that are written now, but they were written, you know, a couple, couple decades back. But People hearing them in my recital, they were like, oh my God, this is gorgeous. Where did you find this? In our school library. Keep your community, your a blackness at your school because they will keep you grounded. I wasn't with my black friends in conservatory because they were taking chemistry classes. I was in music theory four or something, whatever. But 
when I was in those walls, I knew I had to operate a certain way and it, it was hard wearing that line. But outside of those doors, those same friends were the ones who were like, okay, girl, come on, let's go watch Real Housewives of Atlanta. Like, clear your mind. Get, get yourself together. Let's, let's go. Those are the people that, whether conservatory life supports you or not, are going to be the ones that have your back regardless. They'll be sitting on the front row like they did at both of my recitals and cheer you on when the voice faculty is sitting in the corner looking tough. Period. I'm done. Um, yes, Victoria. Amen and Ashe. Um, last thing, I'm going to be done. As she was saying, what she spoke to, the community and the good community, a good healthy community is, is nourishing. It's freeing. It's, it doesn't deplete. It fills. It affirms, right? And so, for those who are in those spaces, I understand. I, I, you know, although I went to an HBCU, my master's is from BU and there were like maybe four of us. And when I got to BU, I was the black guy because I wasn't afraid to say, well, that's, this is what, you know, black folks in my experience do. And da, 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 da. I'm like, are you the black? They said this to my best friend who's also black and was like, that's just kind of like the black guy, right? Yeah, I'm calling y'all out. Um, yeah, uh, and I'm not ashamed to be the black guy. Now, the other side is that's my mantle. I'm not ashamed to, or not, not ashamed. I'm not worried about um, taking those things on and carrying on a certain load. But other folks, you don't got to do that. You don't have to be the token. You don't have to be the voice. You are very, you have the agency to do other things. Also, building community outside. If your school got D9, if your school got a black government association, uh, black student government association, if your school got all these other things, do that. Also, where's your spiritual or faith or community based thing? Yo, just go hang out at the coffee shop in the, uh, in the other part of town. Go down, to, if, you, if your school is near an HBCU, go to homecoming, kick it, we there. We're not, we're not like, come on, see us. Like I have taken in many a kid from Vanderbilt and Belmont. They are in Wakanda Corral too, right? It's about the community. It's about bringing us all together. You can find that affirmation. And sometimes the thing is that the school is gonna try to do some certain things. You go ahead and you facilitate yourself and say, you know what? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm also kind of keeping my head down and just kind of getting through this. I'm gonna say no to this. I'm gonna say yes to this. I'm gonna do what I gotta do. But guess what? When I finish out of here, I, got, I know your secrets. I know your tools. I know how you think now. Boom, we out. That's it. I love everything that everybody said. That was so great. Thank you so, so much. Um, I just want you guys to remember that you are part of a long line, a long legacy of phenomenal opera singers. So if you remember that, they'll give you power and I hope that will strengthen you on your journey. Thank you so much to the panelists. Um, I'll give y'all one second, two seconds to say <laughs> your name where people can find you things like that. You can also drop that in the chat. Two seconds, because we got to move on. Um, but that'll be my last thing. But also, just thank you so much. This discussion was so beautiful. Thank you for to everybody who participated and asked questions. Um, get your questions ready for the next uh, couple of seminars. And we just wanted you to tell you like your name, where people can find you on Instagram, all that kind of stuff. And you can also drop it in the chat. I'm sorry, we were supposed to say our names, right? I can't, Renee, I can't. Oh yeah, <laughs> say where people can find you really quickly and then um, drop it in the chat and we'll move on to the next thing. Okay, my name is Victoria Davis. You can find me on Instagram because Facebook is you know, dead for me at Victoriously Human, V-I-T-O-R-I-O-U, whatever. Victoriously Human, that's the name of the game, amen. My name is Chantel Brazil, Chantel L. Brazil on Facebook, Chantel Classical Singer on Instagram. You can find me at um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, my program, I Too Sing. Um, it's I underscore two underscore sing underscore black BLK. I'll put it in the chat. Um, and um, 
my personal music page is Magnolia, weird name, M-A-G dot N-O-L dot I-A, I believe. I'll put that in the chat as well. I'm typing up everything, but like, follow me. I'm at Patrick Daly on most, at, at Patrick Daly CT on mostly everything. Uh, also a, um, and yeah, follow my fan page, Patrick Daly Counter Tenor. Um, yeah, I'll follow and search for Big Blue Opera Initiatives at Tennessee State, definitely on Facebook and Twitter. We, oh, yeah, we don't have an IG. And then follow, uh, look up for um, W Crim Singers, AKA Wakanda Corral on IG. It's W Crim Singers of Wakanda. And on Twitter, it's uh, W Crim Singers. On Facebook, it is W Crim Singers, AKA Wakanda Corral. So just follow us. We got a lot of stuff happening. <laughs>